When you was a little boy, uh, very young, you wanted to go in show business. And I think you probably have accomplished some of the things that was in your mind that you want to accomplish. And so now you feel that if you had to do it again, you'd rather be a doctor. All right. So I guess it's going to be a lot of things I'd rather be. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if I wouldn't still be a performer. Because in this life, I just, I love music, and music is is my love. You know, it's it's all I know. But um, if I, if I, I'm thinking that if I were not musical, if I didn't have talent, musical talent, somewhat, that I'd probably enjoy being a doctor. I like to make people feel better. Well, I can say that you have always loved people. Even from a small child, you know, when your father used to take you to church, where all other children, you know, would be sitting down where they belong. <laughs> You have to get up in the Ross or somewhere if you have to sit on the little edge of it or somewhere near the piano or so you can see the little head sticking up. He's a little small fella, but that's, that's where you Marvin, always that's find that's yourself. That's the way Marvin is. Around He's the, be on the stage. As people say, you, you was found always among the doctors and the lawyers, the preachers, the deacons, or somebody. You were where children was. You don't find me around too many lawyers today. <laughs> Two deacons, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, why not the lawyers? Well, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> How'd you like the concert last night? I probably can't express it to you exactly how I felt, but it was a terrific feeling to know, I think, about my son. <laughs> and after a moment, and wait, the people, you know, I guess my joy from the people, the reaction of the people. so much fun and so great I don't feel like staying a couple extra days. Did you just need a little r and Well, I just needed really liquids. I was totally dehydrated. I was suffering from that uh, three times in my life and I, I kind of hate water, you know, and I never replace as much as I, I lose, especially on concert tours. Here we go. Off the to tour again. Bye-bye, Jim. I'll see you later. Well, I think that, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend I'm a saint. Mm -hmm. or a monk or anything, but uh, I am uh, what I am, and I think as a whole individual, uh, one should in express what uh, one feels and what one feels inside one's soul as an artist, and whoops, pardon me, and um, I just try and express life as I see it, and uh, certainly sensuality and sex uh, is a great part of our lives. Uh, we don't like to speak of it too often. It seems better if it's done quietly, but um, I don't mind recording about it, and I feel that uh, it's been within taste. Uh, as far as the spirituality is concerned, I'm, a, I'm the son of a apostolic minister, and uh, I know a great deal about God, and I been with God all my life, and uh, there too, um, it sounds a bit hypocritical, but um, I'm 
pretty religious guy. I don't feel that uh, uh, sex and religion, um, uh, they're both controversial, but um, if one can work it out properly, I think it works okay. I don't know how many phases my music's gone through. I write my music according to my lifestyle. If I'm sad, I write sad music. If I'm being divorced, I write divorce albums. If I'm, uh, if I'm sexy, if I feel hot and no horny, or something, I'll write a horny album. Yeah. <laughs> then, was it? Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. There, it's a result of um, three or four things. One thing was I was undergoing two divorces at the same time, which can be rough, traumatic by itself. And then I was in bankruptcy. All my property had been confiscated, and there was a lot of money and a lot of property, millions of dollars, and that was rough, leaving me penniless. And then I was really having quite a political upheaval with Motown at the time, and we weren't getting on at all. And I was really broke, and things didn't look too good, so I was stuck in this forest, and I couldn't see. Well, yeah, I didn't tell you. I owed the government four million bucks too, so that was, that was that's enough to leave the country, you know. You owe the government four million bucks. I, I forgot to tell you that. I just want everybody to know what I got the heck out of Doc. <laughs> was you deeply, profoundly disappointed in you when you when you, when you didn't make that team? Does the Detroit Lions? I, I was, I was disappointed to tears. Let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you why you. So you know why you didn't make it one thing. <laughs> Let me use answers to pray for you. That's one time I didn't break for you. <laughs> I won't tell you why, because I didn't want them to break you up. Hello. And the only thing I could see and visualize my boy on the stretch the first time somebody hit you, carrying you out. Remember you told me when you trained with them somewhere, they found there, you know, I said, well, they naturally be easy on you. I said, well, wait till those opponents come in there. You know what I'm saying? No, I can take it, you know. It, uh... I did good. I went through a month at uh, Eastern Michigan, and they had a pretty, pretty tough bunch of guys up there, and um, we hit every day. Yeah, they really did. They hit you. They didn't feel they lighting up on you. Well, they, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't get hurt. You know, I had just a normal bump. But you can get hurt, you know, but I feel like football is a strange sport. I can play football. I don't, if I can get in shape with me, I'm probably too old. Now. But if I were not too old to play, I have the mentality to play football. I know I do because, you know, you, whatever, whatever deficiencies you may have as an athlete on a football field, if you use your brains along with your ability, you can generally negate, uh, you know, like, if a guy's stronger than you, if you're a little quicker, then you can negate his strength somewhat. And it goes like that. So, you know, I have the mentality to really play the game. That's why I never really got hurt. But I, I could have played. I'll never forget the day when you left home, when you got in that station wagon with the Harvest people, and you, you functioned me on the door, looking up to tell me goodbye. And I went to you goodbye, and that's when you left home, and things began to move there. You went through a period of, I guess, a uh, little hardships, which is, which is a part of a person's bring them up and, and a part of their, you know, build them up. And finally, when you first put out your first record, seemed to me, I was surprised along the way. I said, here's a dream come true. I had a lot of dreams about you, and I saw it in the end. I said, now, you're doing the very thing which you told me you would do with that form of training. I'll never forget that picture, you getting in that car. You, you, you'll be surprised the feeling that the parents has when they see these children leaving going out in the world, not knowing. And then those days, you know, juvenile delinquency was prevalent all over the nation. And the only thing we can get this feeling, oh, I hope you don't know do it, go anywhere and get into trouble. So we, we had to live with that. And by you not getting into trouble, that was a great burden off of your mother and our minds and our hearts. And I'm gonna give to you now because these cameras and for these people, I think you want for myself. As long as I know you have a humble mind and as long as you know there's a guard upstairs, you can call on him and respect the people. I thank you a real wonderful person. I almost, I'm going to give that to you. It's my son. And I'm proud of you. They killed by his father. Why did it happen? Terry Drinkwater looked for the answer. Bad blood between father and son. That was what the police called in today. Fans this afternoon who passed the family home where it happened, played his music, and prayed for the soul from which it came. Well, it's God and, and the devil. And uh, 
the devil just just won this one this time, but still the force of God's going to win in the end, I think. The dispute, authorities now conclude, began Saturday night, an argument over insurance between the 69-year-old minister and his renowned son. The shouting continued Sunday, and then the argument turned physical. There was some pushing and shoving, and apparently Marvin Jr. Got the, was getting the better of that, and the mother interceded and separated them. Uh, moments later, the father reappeared. He had a, uh, a handgun with him, and he fired two shots, fatally wounded. No drugs, no alcohol were involved. For the matter of Marvin Penn's gaze, senior case number A751295. Matter here for arraignment of plea. Can I have the appearance of counsel, please? Mr. Trump, your client is charged with account of criminal violation 187 of the penal code with a special allegation of personally using a firearm. Are you ready to enter a plea at this time? I'm not entered. I'm not ready to enter a plea at this particular time, Your Honor. I'm going to make a motion with respect to the defendant. It's my opinion today that this matter should be referred to. For me, it, um, what shall I say about 1975 to 1983 has been very good. In fact, the last seven years of my life haven't been exactly ecstatic for me. I haven't been ecstatic. I've been happy and um, somewhat, um, most of the time, pretty depressed. But um, my depression is, um, I think, because of my empathy for humanity and my... Um, my feelings for the world and uh, things, and uh, I, um, I'm awfully upset when I have to do things to achieve a certain amount of status so that I might be able to do something else so that people will listen to me. I have to do things to achieve a certain amount of status so that I might be able to do something else so that people will listen to me. He was declining rapidly into a life of drug addiction and abuse. All of his relationships failed, and he was becoming more and more paranoid. He confided to his band that he was being hounded by murderers, and started wearing a bulletproof vest. Marvin was staying in his parents' house on April 1, 1984, in the Crenshaw district of Los Angeles. Marvin was scattered, doing tons of cocaine and watching pornography. He was sporting a bathrobe that he'd been wearing for several days. He toted a pistol in the pocket of his bathrobe, and had a small weaponry underneath his bed. He was absolutely positive that he was going to be murdered. On Christmas Day 1983 Marvin gifted his father an unregistered 38 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol, to arm his father against the people he thought were after him. As stated by multiple sources, Marvin had a tumultuous relationship with his father, Marvin Gay Sr. Marvin Sr. often told his children, quote, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. It's said that his father abused Marvin as a child, and was resentful of his fame and glory, but still survived off of the profits. He basically said, he basically thanked the judge for his mercy. He told the judge that he loved his son. He told the judge that he wished that this didn't happen. He told me that he wished that this didn't happen. He told Mike he wished that this didn't happen. I wish it didn't happen. We lost a great artist. We lost a wonderful, a wonderful singer. And dare we forget, uh, you know, the marvelous moments that Marvin, you know, meant to all of us. But Marvin was a tragic figure, a very tragic figure. And Marvin met an end that Marvin engineered i believe Mr. that's Gold, my personal belief. a lot of his fans expressed outrage at the shooting how do you hope them how, how do you hope they will react or... i i hope that i hope they'll react by by <clears throat> accepting the very gracious philosophy of the prosecutor's office and the court uh in in doing no further trauma to the family. Don't do any more trauma I add. With that. As far as the fans are concerned, the outrage of the fans, I think, was uh, more at the beginning before the full facts were revealed. And uh, I think now that 
to the media, if the media exposes what really happened that day and the fans are aware of it, I think they will feel the way the court felt for Marvin Gaye Sr. Yeah, well, what about, what about Mrs. Gaye? Uh, as far as I understand, she did not support the no, that's not true. Mrs. Gay, in fact, posted bail for her husband. And this was after, this was after the that was not true. Well, what, what, is, what is her, uh, where is she now? Mrs. Gay lives in town, standing on the sidewalk, and we did not feel this is proper in this case. Yeah, I, I agree with the judge. I think it would kill him. I don't know. You, you saw his condition. I don't know that uh, uh, he'd last through even maybe a 90-day diagnostic study out of Chino. He's really fallen apart. From uh, indications in the case, this was a considered to be a case of self-defense that uh, that the defendant had been attacked in fact why then any probation or any sentencing at all why not a straight acquittal well he pled uh, he entered a plea uh, no contest plea to the voluntary manslaughter so it, if he wanted a straight acquittal he would have had to go to trial for it since he pled that it's going to be a probation period do you, you believe justice has been served in this case then yes. the way things turned out yeah i think so yeah. Uh, i was undergoing two divorces doing the same and um that's a bit of pressure a lot of people probably think of that as, as running away from from the situation well, a, a wise general if he's a good general and a good tactician is certainly um familiar with the the art of retreat and regrouping uh for a better fight better day i simply look at my departure as uh, just such a a thing, and uh, I'm here for rearmed mentally, physically, and spiritually. And hopefully, I'm ready for a better fight. In the past, Gay's fight for a share of the pop audience was done on Motown Records. For them, he recorded hits like Hitchhike, How Sweet It Is, Heard It Through the Grapevine. Eventually, disagreements with Motown contributed to Gay's decision to hide out in Europe. I've had difficulties with Motown, but I'm not sure it was um, their fault. I'm a difficult person. I, I admit that. Did you, did you try to make yourself a little bit more difficult so they would let you go? Now, boy, it, um, that's rather incriminating in a way. But, um... Perhaps. Are there going to be lawsuits on your part against no, Motown? No, no, not it's lawsuits. Normal um, audits and things like that. Normal audit. You feel that you haven't been paid what you deserve. Now, boy, I never said that. And uh, Would you say it? Would I? Yes, I would. Do you feel freer now that you're not recording for Motown? Do you feel like you have... Did I, if I say yes, that would... That would mean I felt locked up or somehow imprisoned or in bondage or something like that. <laughs> well, not in bondage, but to, well, to too much. Uh, in bondage, we got to watch that word, yes. But the, um, ha, ha, ha. Yes, yes, I do, frankly, feel freer. Uh, yes, I was, in fact, um, yes, I did feel clothed then and um, uh, with nowhere to go. Uh, yes, I did feel that I had, um, uh, uh, outlive my usefulness for uh, for the company. You, Mr. Joel. Yes, sir. Right here, right here, right here. And have you, Mr. Chef? Yes. And have you, Ms. Grocky? Yes. Wave a ring for judgment. Sorry. Sorry. Any legal cause? No. I'll hear your comments. Thank you. Not with re reference to the circumstances of mitigation, which I feel support a straight uh, probation with the imposition. The victim was, in our opinion, the aggressor and the provocateur. He inflicted a severe beating to the defendant contemporaneous with the shooting. the Union was, and well, the Vietnamese war was raging hot and heavy during that period that we conceived it, and there was a lot of unrest in America. Our 
college kids being shot in campuses. And my brother was at war, and I prayed a lot that he would come through safely. And it was a very, a very trying period for me at Motown, even. It was a I was struggling one. for some sort of uh, independence and some sort of recognition as producer and trying to let the artist in me come to forefront and not be produced. And not but in that album, too, in addition to your personal problems, in addition to the war, you were talking about what we were doing to the air and to the food we were eating. Well, I'm trying to write a, a, a general kind of broad statement. I don't want to step on any toes particularly, and I still don't, but it was um, it was quite a, an experience. I I recall, I don't recall much about the, uh, the album. I feel it was very divine and and personal. Well, very personal, very divine. I don't, I don't hardly remember writing the song. I mean, it was like I was in a kind of a some sort of other dimension or something when we did it. Personal, very divine. I don't, I don't hardly remember writing the song. I mean, it was like I was in a kind of a some sort of other dimension or something when we did it. So 